सो हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू द क्वालिटी एनरिचमेंट प्रोग्राम बाई बाजीराव आई ए एस अकेडमी सो इन दिस प्रोग्राम वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग एंड एनालाइजिंग द प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन पेपर्स सो द ओवरऑल ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ दिस प्रोग्राम इज टू इक्विप यू विद एडिकुएट स्किल टू राइट द बेस्ट पॉजिबल आंसर्स इन योर मेन्स एग्जामिनेशन सो थ्रू दिस प्रोग्राम वी हैव बीन फुलफिलिंग टू ऑब्जेक्टिवस वन इज कॉम्प्रहेंसिवली डिस्कसिंग द प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चन पेपर्स एंड सेकेंडली understanding the structuring of the answers so that over a period of time you will know how to structure the answer and how to write the best possible answer since upsc has been continuously repeating the themes of the question regularly following this program will help you to write the best possible answers thereby fine tuning your preparation as well so the first question that we are going to discuss here uh, today is discuss the significance of lion and bull figures in indian mythology art and architecture so this question is asked from general studies paper 1 now in general studies paper 1 indian culture is part of the syllabus so this question has been asked from indian culture now in indian culture lion and bull figures have a lot of significance whether it is indian mythology art architecture so in different phases of our indian history you can see the significance of both lion and bull now in introduction you can write briefly about the significance the usage of bull and lion in various periods across the history now since the advent of the human beings so animals have always played the role of a companion they have played the role of a companion so this role can be called as a complementary role along with the humans because since the prehistoric times human beings started domesticating the animals so they started living with the animals itself so the traces of human animal relationship can be found from the prehistoric times itself so okay so the prehistoric times started early 12000 years itself okay so the human animal relationship can be found or can be traced back to 12000 years ago however in this particular human animal relationship two animals play a very significant and a very important role so the two animals are lion and bull okay so since the question is about the significance of lion and bull you need to briefly introduce t- these two animals along with writing about the human animal companionship or the relationship so from the stone age to the modern period the traces of these two animals were found okay so uh, the traces of these two animals were preserved and even found in different uh, literary accounts so however this could be understand how this uh, we can understand from various aspects firstly uh, when we talk about mythology we very often see that lion is being used as a, a vehicle for goddess durga okay so if you generally see the statue of a goddess durga so you can found that lion is being used as a vahana of goddess durga and similarly if you look at bull so bull is also being used as a vahana by lord shiva right so uh, this is called as nandi bull okay so this is the nandi bull so this is being used by lord shiva as vahana so in fact you also come across uh, the word asura asura okay so asura asura killed uh, a demon who was killed by goddess durga so asura asura was also a buffalo demon okay so uh, similarly nandi which actually means giving delight or giving joy is actually a sacred bull of the hindu god shiva so this is the significance of both lion and bull in the hindu mythology now after that so we can also write uh, the significance or the mentioning of the sculpt the mentioning of lion and uh, bull in indian sculpture now if you carefully observe indian emblem 
ओके सो दिस सारनाथ द लाइन कैपिटल ऑफ अशोका दैट वॉज फाउंड इन सारनाथ दैट बिकम नेशनल एम्बलम ऑफ इंडिया यू कैन सी द लाइन्स द फोर लाइन्स विच आर स्टैंडिंग बैक टू बैक ओके सो दैट वॉज अडॉप्टेड एज अ नेशनल एम्बलम ऑफ इंडिया सो एलॉन्ग विथ दीज फोर लाइन्स सो वी कैन ऑल्सो फाउंड द अदर एनिमल्स in this uh, the lion capital itself so the other uh, animals include elephant galloping horse bull and lion so these all these animals were separated by the intervening circles okay so there was intervening circles and one animal so these were separated by these intervening wheels over the bell shaped lotus okay so if you observe the uh, lion capital so you can uh, see the bell shaped lotus in this lotus itself you can observe all the animals so in this the bull represents the zodiac sign of taurus however the lion represents or the it shows the attainment of enlightenment so this is the significance of both lion and bull in the lion capital that was found at saranath now even if you look at the indus valley civilization in indus valley civilization also there were evidences of bronze bull now the bronze bull of indus valley civilization actually signifies the presence of bronze in the indus valley civilization so this civilization is also called as a bronze age civilization because there was a remarkable progress in terms of bronze made artifacts and bronze culture so because of this reason indus valley civilization is also called as bronze age civilization and if you observe the rock art in tamil nadu in tamil nadu also there was a representation of bull in the rock art okay so a uh, tamil nadu the prehistoric men have uh, you know they they have captured the bull and they used to capture the bulls and they also used to tame them in order to domesticate those bulls and all these things have been beautifully uh, you know carved on the uh, in the form of rock art okay in tamil nadu so uh, this is the significance of art and architecture uh, about bull now when when we talk about the architecture the the significance of bull and lion in, in architecture so we can talk about the mauryan pillars so uh, if you carefully observe the mauryan pillars the top portion of the pillar was actually carved with figures like bull lion and elephant so the pillars uh, ashoka has produced a number of pillars so among all those pillars you can carefully if you carefully observe you can see bull lion and elephant so the mauryan symbolism of lines depiction of lines on these pillars generally indicate that the power of a universal emperor or also called as chakravarti okay also called as chakravarti so therefore it is dedicated all his resources for the victory of dharma or dhamma that was propagated by ashoka ashoka has propagated the policy of dhamma so this is also very important for your exam so secondly in architecture we need to talk about the sanji stupa that found in madhya pradesh and it is one of the most famous and most important uh you know ashoka stupas the sanchi stupa because the rock engravings of lion with wings and also bull has been found in the torana of these stupas so you may have seen the sanchi stupa so that is the oldest uh you know one of the most oldest stupas in india so this stupa has also uh, contains the rock engravings of both lion and bull okay so these animals are found in the torana of the stupa so this is the overall significance of the lion and bull in the indian mythology indian culture architecture and art so however when you write the conclusion for this answer so you can just mention that the traces in the ancient india to significance of the national symbol of the country so the national emblem was the lion capital that was found at saranath so this also has lion and bull so they have witness of phases of development and changes that were taken place in india over a period of time 
okay so it also represents india's culture that has been evolving from the prehistoric times to the modern times so this is how you need to write the significance of both lion and bull in indian mythology and overall history so the uh, next question that we are going to discuss is about the ocean currents now in geography ocean currents are very important topic okay so for both prelims and mains perspective ocean currents are very important topic now in the image you can see here there are different ocean currents both uh, there are two types of ocean currents cold currents and warm currents now the currents which are being represented in red color are called as the warm currents and the currents which are represented in blue color are cold currents okay for example the peru current is a cold current however the south equatorial current is a warm current and north equatorial current is a red current and california current is a blue current so they circulate around the global oceans so thereby they they play a very important role in you know circulation of heat balancing the temperatures and even bringing nutrients to other parts of the global oceans so therefore they play a very crucial and very important role in you know of uh, developing a fishing industry in a particular area so in this context so we need to understand what are the major forces that influence the ocean currents firstly so you write the definition of ocean currents what exactly ocean currents means and secondly you write the forces that influence ocean currents forces influence the ocean currents so in the second part of the question you need to write the role of these ocean currents in the fishing industry across the world so this is the second part of the answer and while writing conclusion you just mention the overall significance or the importance of ocean currents okay so you can write the significance of ocean currents or you can mention any threats to these ocean currents because of global warming and climate change so that is how you can frame a holistic answer framing a holistic answer with a very good structure is very important for scoring good marks right now initially we need to define what exactly the ocean currents write a brief description about ocean currents now ocean currents are actually a continuous movement or the continuous circulation of ocean water okay so it has a path okay and it actually the ocean currents the ocean currents actually flow like a rivers in the ocean so they have a, a desired path and through which they flow like a rivers in the oceans however so if you understand the importance of these ocean currents they play one of the most important role in maintaining earth's climate distributing heat and supporting the marine life so how they distribute heat for example this is equator tropic of cancer tropic of capricorn and this is the polar region now the waters from the polar region would be mixed with the waters of the tropical oceans now if you carefully understand the oceans at the polar regions are colder in nature compared to the oceans in the tropical regions so therefore the the heat and the temperature would be get transferred into the colder oceans in the polar regions so in this manner they distribute heat and they also help in maintaining the earth's climate for example when the cold waters are mixed with the warm waters from the tropical regions that would uh, you know ensure the earth's climate that would avoid extremes of the earth extremes means that uh, you know excessive or extreme temperatures or low temperatures so that may not provide proper conditions for life on planet earth so this is the significance of these ocean currents similarly the primary forces that actually influence these ocean currents include wind temperature salinity gradient and earth rotation so these are the major forces that affect the ocean currents so what are those forces wind temperature salinity 
in the oceans and also earth's rotation so earth's rotation you can uh, hear coriolis force okay coriolis is force now this coriolis force actually uh, blows in right direction in the northern hemisphere okay so blows in the uh, right direction in the northern hemisphere blows towards left in the southern hemisphere so therefore this also helps in influencing the ocean currents similarly wind also uh, helps in for example when wind is blowing over the surface of the ocean so this is the surface of the ocean when wind is blowing over the surface of the ocean so these winds drag a certain degree of ocean water so this also influences the ocean currents temperature salinity gradients also have a certain degree of influence or the impact on these ocean currents now if you look at the wind so they were primarily driven by the global wind systems okay so global wind system are generally fueled by the energy of the sun so you know this is a basic uh, uh, concept for example due to the insulation of the sun over a particular area so there's a difference of the insulation of these uh, you know uh, sun uh, temperatures for example due, uh, in the tropical regions in the tropical regions there would be more insulation of the sun however on the subpolar and polar regions there would be lesser insulation of the sun now in these areas low pressure area is being created and in these areas high pressure area is being created and winds are generally flow from the high pressure area to low pressure area okay so in this way the global wind systems are actually uh, formed and driven so the wind direction coriolis force from earth's rotation so because of the earth's rotation from uh, uh, you know west to east uh everything the position of land forms interact with these currents so secondly temperature and salinity gradients also have a major impact on the ocean currents for example the density differences in ocean the water masses for example uh, due to the uh, inflow of fresh water rivers into uh, the seas and excessive rainfall there is a, a density differences or salinity gradients so these density differences uh, in water masses due to heavy temperatures or the excessive temperature or the salinity variations so they also influence the formation or the movement of the ocean currents now this movement of the ocean currents also have a huge influence on the uh, you know uh, bringing nutrients to the surface waters and oxygen and transferring heat to the different other uh, parts of our country of uh, parts of our uh, the world so therefore it helps in maintaining the heat balance across the globe so the second uh, thirdly earth's rotation and coriolis force also have a major impact on these ocean currents so the coriolis force that generally uh, flows uh, towards the right side in the northern hemisphere and left side in the southern hemisphere also influences the ocean currents formation and their movement lastly gravity also influences the movement of these ocean currents because you know uh, the gravity creates the density differences the density differences are primarily created by the temperature or solar insulation and salinity variations across the different parts of the ocean so all these factors influencing the formation of ocean currents so they have been influencing the formation of ocean currents now the second part of the answer is ocean currents and what is the uh, you know impact of these ocean currents on the fishing industry or the development of a fishing industry in a particular region now if you carefully observe these ocean currents have most prominent and most significant impact on the distribution of marine resources distribution of marine resources or marine life across the oceans because these ocean currents very often uh, help in formation of a uh, you know conditions that are suitable for the fish fish growth fish survival so firstly we need to talk about the nutrient availability 
the currents that affect the availability of nutrients for plant growth so which in turn influences the food availability for marine animals for example uh, the uh, the winds or the ocean currents that move from the one part of the oceans to the other part of the oceans so they also bring nutrients with them so these nutrients will help developing the uh, the phytoplankton now this phytoplankton is being used as a food by the fish and there is another concept called bottom upwelling now bottom upwelling is also being fueled by these ocean currents where the nutrient rich bottom waters are brought into the surface and that forms a favorable condition for the developing fish okay now the benugula current system of the west coast of south africa now in south africa west coast south africa west coast there's a benugula current so this benugula current system of the coast of uh, west of south africa supports the growth of plankton now the plankton in turn provide food for the fish or sardines during the natal sardine run so therefore it uh, you know provide conditions for the a uh, favorable fish catch secondly these uh, ocean currents create fish uh, rich fishing grounds so rich fishing grounds in the sense that uh, the region where two ocean currents meet the region where two ocean currents meet so that provides a favorable condition for the growth of fish because of excessive availability of nutrients and famous uh, you know most suitable environmental conditions so because of the meeting of two currents so that forms a favorable fishing ground now uh, we can talk about the cold labrador current so this is equator and uh, okay so this is equator and this is uh, south america africa and uh, this is north america and then europe so this is where the labrador current and the west the warm gulf stream meet okay so this is where the labrador current and the warm gulf stream meet and in this region there was a ideal breeding ground forms ideal breeding ground for fish and this region is popularly called as grand banks area okay so why because it is world's richest fishing grounds so because of this region this reason it is called as grand banks area secondly the ocean currents also influence the migration of fish species from one part of the ocean to the other part of the ocean okay so they also in turn impact the distribution of fish species and the location of fishing grounds so these things are also influenced by the ocean currents now when fish population has been migrating from one part of the ocean to the other part of the ocean that provides a favorable fish catch for the fishermen so therefore it also supports livelihoods for these fishermen or the coastal communities coastal communities so therefore it is very important to ensure the livelihood security of these people as well as nutrition or food security okay so these are the multiplier benefits because of the ocean currents and lastly we should also talk about the upwelling now i have already told about upwelling now in upwelling generally what happens uh, was because of these ocean currents the bottom nutrients the bottom nutrient rich waters are being replaced by new water and this bottom nutrient rich waters came into the surface and that further propel the growth of phytoplankton plus zooplankton so both phytoplankton and zooplankton helps in propel uh, helps in developing a favorable fishing ground in a particular area now we can mention examples of uh, the western coast of south america and also the western coast of northern america so there's a ocean upwelling usually takes place 
so that also forms an ideal breeding ground for fish right so in the conclusion you just have to mention the overall significance or the importance of these ocean currents now no doubt ocean currents play one of the vital and most important role in fishing industry how it plays a fish, uh, vital role in fishing industry we have already discussed that okay uh, so they have they used to influence the growth of fish populations distribution and the migration of these fish species so in this context understanding the forces uh, that particularly drive the ocean currents and their impact on the fishing industry is actually very important for the sustainable management and conservation of marine resources now because of global climate change and global warming in case uh, 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 in turn the fish species have also been facing extreme stress okay so there is a reports of illegal unregulated unreported fishing activities that have been depleting the fishing stocks as well so uh, in the context of all these threats and challenges it is very important to ensure sustainable management and conservation of marine resources so properly understanding these ocean currents and making efforts to bring down the climate change and global warming concerns will help developing favorable or ideal fishing grounds that further sustain the livelihood security and nutrition security of global population and the coastal communities who are living in these marine resources so in this positive way you can conclude this answer so this uh, give a sense of coherence and holisticness to your answer so the next question that we are going to discuss is about the rubber producing countries across the globe okay so this is part of a geography distribution of resources across the world okay so distribution of resources is also one of the main component in the syllabus of general studies paper 1 now describing the distribution of rubber producing countries indicate the major environmental issues being faced by them so because of the rubber produ- rubber production natural rubber production what are the major challenges to the environment now in this image you can see uh, you know uh, three colored lines so the lines which are represented here in yellow they signify that the rubber production in north america africa parts of africa and rubber which is being cultivated in less than 10 hectares of land however in blue lines you can see a rubber cultivation or the rubber production more than 10000 to 10 lakh hectares however in south east asia there is a highest cultivation of rubber uh, that amounts to 10 to 35 lakh hectares okay so this is the global rubber distribution across different parts of uh, the world now understand the basic characteristics of rubber plantation now rubber is categorized as a, a plantation crop okay so rubber is a natural rubber is actually a polymer of a isoprene so this is called as a you no know, organic compound and obtained from the latex of the tropical trees so the most popular or most famous among them is a rubber tree called hevia brasiliensis so this is one of the most popular rubber tree rubber tree so if you look at the age of these rubber trees so they uh, their life span is around 32 years in the plantations so soil type which majorly suits the rubber cultivation include the well drained and well weathered soils so the examples of these well weathered soils are laterite type alluvial and sedimentary soils now the temperature and the precipitation related conditions which suits the cultivation of these rubber plantation include that the rainfall should be around 100 rainy days so in a particular year there should be 100 rainy days and the temperature should be moderate from 20 degree celsius to 34 degree celsius now the humidity conditions a humidity requirement of around 80 percentage and 2000 e hours of sunshine in a particular year and there should be an absence of strong winds 
is also the necessary condition however if you look at the uses of these natural rubbers so they are generally preferred over the synthetic or artificial rubber because it's high tensile strength vibration dampening properties along with the tear resistance because of all these factors the natural rubber is preferred over synthetic artificial rubber so the uh, the in the map given in the image it shows that the areas where rubber is cultivated however 75 percentage of rubber which is produced in india comes alone from kerala state okay so 75 percentage of rubber comes from kerala state alone now in this context uh, please understand that uh, you need to give a brief introduction about the rubber cultivation in india so there are 28 countries okay around 28 countries they have been producing rubber across the world okay so the most distinct and most important characteristic uh, of these rubber tree is it is a tropical crop tropical crop so i hope you know what is a tropical region okay so this is equator tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn and this area around equator is called as a tropical region and tropical region forms a favorable conditions for the cultivation of rubber so because of this reason kerala accounts for around 75 percentage of total rubber cultivation in india okay so rubber tree majorly grows in tropical climate and tropical climate with consistent temperatures of around 25 to 30 degree celsius as i have already told you that rubber plant requires moderate climates so it also requires around 200 centimeters of rainfall or 100 days of rain in a year okay so that would particularly support the hardy trees hardy uh, or support the healthy rubber trees now countries with ideal equatorial climate now all the countries in southeast asia uh, south america and africa so they have a famous or ideal equatorial climate and they produce natural rubber okay so uh, for decades thailand has been one of the largest producers of rubber okay so thailand has been producing the largest amounts of rubber and it has been contributing around 35 percentage of global rubber production okay natural rubber production so uh, in this pie chart you can observe a few countries which have been producing the largest quantities of rubber so first place thailand followed by indonesia vietnam malaysia china and ivory coast so all these countries have a tropical climate and these tropical climate the tropical climate has been facilitating the growth of rubber crop and because of this reason so these countries are major rubber producing countries so across the world there are only 28 countries which have been producing the natural rubber now in this image you can see how rubber is extracted from a rubber plant okay so uh, rubber milk is extracted from the rubber plant and then the milk will be used for the uh, manufacturing of natural rubber okay so uh, next you can see the distribution of uh, you know rubber plantation because since it is asked you to write about the distribution of rubber plantation across the world you should draw a map and also show different regions where rubber is being cultivated and however don't forget that you need to identify the countries which are around the uh, equator because rubber is a tropical crop and it is mainly cultivated in the tropical regions so all the countries or most of the countries in southeast asia africa where the equator has been passing and brazil so it also has a tropical climate are supporting the rubber plantation now after that we need to talk about the major environmental issues that were being faced by the rubber plantation so what are the major environmental factors see uh, the rubber plantation has been majorly grown in tropical areas so we know that tropical regions have a huge diversity so since they host a huge diversity in order to cultivate the rubber plantation there's a large scale deforestation has been taking place 
okay so the deforestation can be particularly observed in mainland southeast asia now when a deforestation has been taking place uh, in a you know a massive scale or at a massive scale this has also led to the biodiversity's loss at a rapid pace okay so uh, the rubber cropping has been growing because particularly because of its demand uh, at the international scale uh, because the natural rubber is being used in the automobile industry for manufacturing of tires so rubber is grown by deforestation or cutting down trees in these tropical equatorial regions okay deforestation of equatorial vegetation so which is actually known for the species diversity so when you cut down the tree uh, species or when you cut down the trees and that led to the biodiversity loss in these tropical equatorial uh, climatic regions and further it could intensify the fears of climate change because now we have been coming up with several measures like redd redd plus so these measures particularly envision that we need to reduce the global atmospheric carbon through carbon sequestration for uh, through afforestation okay so however the deforestation particularly to grow rubber plants has been fueling the climate change concerns and we cannot be able to uh, sequest uh, you know we cannot be able to done the carbon sequestration okay so that further accentuate the rate of the global warming so after that we should also talk about the spread of diseases so uh, you know the human beings have been making further forays into these rich tropical forests so that comes with new zoonotic diseases recently a pandemic called covid-19 is being uh, so we know that how it has uh, you know created a huge destruction across the globe social economic and every aspect right so it also has a huge threat of spreading these genetic diseases because uh, the other concern is rubber is mostly a monocultural plantation and now we have been emphasizing on the crop diversification so since it is a monocultural uh, plantation there is a huge probability of pest attack and new diseases which have been impacting the uh, rubber plantation so you know that further declines that further leads to the declining rubber yield over a period of time now after that there is a chances of man animal conflicts also and we can mention about the example of recent monkey human conflict in tripura that is particularly because of the deforestation that was done for the rubber plantation so after that there were also cases of stealing indigenous land from the communities who are living in those forests because uh, rubber cultivation is commercially valuable so several uh, people or the private entrepreneurs have been uh, you know stealing the land of these indigenous communities for the rubber cultivation and this is also a concern and with uh, the natural rubber industry there is also a pollution concern because sulfates are released from the latex processing facilities so latex is uh, you know extracted from these natural rubbers and sulfates are released through the latex processing facilities and that is also a major concern however in the conclusion so uh, you need to mention about the best ways to uh, attract uh, be best ways to extract natural rubber okay so in order to ensure more responsible production of natural rubber is to grow trees for rubber production on low quality degraded land now we have been cutting down forests in equatorial regions and equatorial regions are generally known for rich biodiversity they are generally known for rich biodiversity so however we need to focus on growing rubber in low quality degraded lands low quality degraded land so therefore we can refrain ourselves from cultivation of rubber in these uh, you know fertile and high biodiverse regions so that further uh, you know reduces 
the deforestation in those areas however the worldwide fund for nature so uh, the major goal of the worldwide fund for nature is to have the majority of the companies produce and use rubber so they commit sustainably or they produce sustainably and in a ethical manner so particularly the uh, major rubber producing companies include car manufacturers tire makers and rubber processors so therefore the focus should be on ethical and sustainable production of natural rubber without going for deforestation without disturbing the uh, habitats of the wildlife reducing the man animal conflicts and not stealing the indigenous land the land of the indigenous communities for the cultivation of rubber and this is how you can conclude this answer as well so the next question is about the straits and isthmus okay so what is exactly the significance of what is the strait we talked about uh, we hear about malacca strait okay so we hear about malacca strait and we also very often hear about isthmus of kra isthmus of kra to overcome the malacca dilemma in the geopolitics now what is a uh, strait strait is a narrow water body that connects two large water bodies so we can talk about the malacca strait malacca strait that has been connecting the indian ocean with the south china sea south china sea so this can be called as a strait so what is isthmus isthmus is a, a narrow land area that connects two large land masses now central america there's a panama canal okay panama canal so panama canal is created across the isthmus of the panama okay so these are uh, briefly the definition of isthmus and strait now in the introduction itself you just have to briefly define what is isthmus and what is strait and then write the significance of strait and isthmus so firstly geography of global commerce is heavily influenced by the naturally occurring features so what are those naturally occurring features both straits as well as isthmus so these are known as a naturally occurring features now what is a strait now strait is a narrow water body right so this is a narrow water body that is connecting two larger water bodies however when we talk about isthmus isthmus is a narrow strip of land that connecting larger land masses however both strait and isthmus are very important in shaping global trade routes now when we talk about the significance of straits so they are very often used as shortcut routes in global trade they provide a shorter maritime routes because they reduce the distance and travel time between different regions so when they are able to save uh, you know uh, reduce uh, when they are able to reduce the travel time uh, shorten the distance the, uh, the it helps in saving costs and increasing efficiency of international trade so we can talk about the hormuz uh, strait okay so hormuz strait that has been connecting persian gulf with the arabian sea and it is one of the most important strait okay so it is considered as a vital route for the global oil trade secondly we need to talk about uh, the role of these straits uh, like a nodal points okay nodal points so because they are very critical and very important for the global shipping because uh, you know huge quantities or huge volumes of uh, global maritime trade and traffic passes through these straits so therefore they also used as a nodal points for the international trade so nearly 30 percentage of the world's shipping trade volume is passes through the malacca strait malacca strait this is strategically very important the malacca strait now india has an edge over the control of malacca strait when it compares to china 
okay so because of this reason china has been exploring the possibilities or alternatives through china pakistan economic corridor and even isthmus of crow isthmus of crow over the you know uh thailand right so nearly 30 percentage of the world shipping trade volume passes through south china sea and strait of malacca now so if you talk about the isthmus the significance of isthmus firstly we need to talk about the canal construction so through the these isthmus the narrow land uh, areas a canal can be constructed so that the huge travel time travel cost can be significantly reduced and it also helps in increasing the efficiency of global shipping so the example for the same is panama canal okay so this panama canal is located on the isthmus of panama that we have seen already in the image okay so this is isthmus of panama and panama canal has been created through this isthmus okay now this drastically reduces the travel distance for ships moving between the atlantic and the pacific oceans secondly they become trade hubs because they have a huge uh, or unique geography and they often develop into bustling trade hubs and even catalyzing the regional economic growth so we can mention example of isthmus of suez that houses suez canal now suez canal that connects the red sea with the mediterranean sea so the isthmus of suez houses suez canal has spurred major cities like port said and ismailia and so we can also talk about the geopolitical significance of these isthmus so they also hold a huge geopolitical significance because these straits and isthmus uh, you know they are very often become a crucial points now control over these crucial points will provide a geopolitical advantage for different countries for example we need to talk about the malacca strait the hormuz strait the suez canal so all those uh, straits and uh, isthmus have a huge geopolitical significance they play a very important role in power dynamics conflict resolution or conflict creation and even key negotiations so we can mention the example of the strait of gibraltar now if you observe the mediterranean sea carefully here a strait of gibraltar is located and this strait is being controlled by both uk and spain and this strait connects the mediterranean sea with the atlantic ocean okay so this gibraltar strait has been uh, you know a subject to international interest because of its huge strategic importance in controlling access to the mediterranean sea so uh, in conclusion you just mention the significance of strait and isthmus in the international trade okay so the significance extends beyond the physical geography it influences the economic political and strategic considerations at the global level and as international trade continues to grow their relevance and geopolitical value will further increase manifold so in these images you can see the strait of malacca location of the strait of malacca and in fact india have a major advantage over the control of the strait of malacca because of the tri lateral command at the andaman and nicobar islands now the china china has been exploring possibilities of creating uh, a canal across the isthmus of kra so this is called as isthmus of kra and secondly you can see the location of a panama isthmus and panama canal across the panama isthmus okay so this is how you can write the importance of both strait and isthmus okay so that's all for today and uh, uh, if you like the video please uh, hit the like button and also subscribe to our youtube channel so that you will get regular updates and we will be coming up with more courses and that will be helpful for your exam preparation so thank you